Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. All right, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, just on this wonderful and beautiful day, we, we thank you, Lord, just for our many, many blessings uh, that you provide for us, both uh, spiritually, um, psychologically, financially, Lord. We just lift it all up to you. And on this, this wonderful and beautiful day, Lord, we just ask that you take your message, that uh, your perfect message, Lord, that you have prepared for us today. Uh, calm our hearts, calm our, calm our minds. Lord, just let us focus on you through your servant today uh, so that we can hear your message as you as you would have it custom for each of us where we are today and in our hearts. Father, these things we ask of you, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3? We just uh, finished up, came to the last uh, two verses of chapter 2. We're going to bridge into to this morning study. So we're trying something new. This is Dylan back here on the camera trying to record the sermon on um, video for our dear brothers and sisters uh, over there in Phoenix. There's some ones that want... And we have with us Anita Guin, who is one of her husband, Rich, was one of the elders in our fellowship in early Calvary Chapel days in uh, Calvary Tri-City. So what a blessing. She can. I just called John Higgins yesterday. Spoiler. He he knew you were you were coming. So we we visited and I got to share with him that we got blessed with tickets from my brother in law to come see grandpa for Christmas. And of course, with John, I don't know if that means I'll get the Sunday off or not. It usually means um, no. So so I, I told him, if you need me, and it's not an imposition, he's like, it's not an imposition. And so I'll probably be sharing live back there, and, uh, and they have all this stuff already set up. But we're trying to record for the first time um, so that we can put it on Facebook and so that they can, uh, our dear sister CJ, remember CJ and Sean, the worship leader? She wants to do a, show it on a big screen TV, our church on the beach over there in Arizona so that people can um, gather there and, uh, and get encouraged. And it's such a blessing to me that the Word of God can go from all the way from here in Hawaii to all over the world. This is going to open up some doors. We've been having requests from the people in Russia for many years. Kevin used to always listen to my sermons whenever we would put them you know, on the Internet. And now we'll be able to have the video. The kids today, they don't just like the, the audio thing. they got to have the picture. You know, with it, but we'll do the best. That I, after they see my ugly mug a few times, they won't want it anymore. They'll just go back to audio. But uh, for right now, we'll just go with it and do the best we can. So, so we're gonna try this out, and um, we're asking the Lord to just let us build up believers wherever they are. And we're really blessed, Lord. You know, with with this wallpaper that we have here, and with the whales coming in. If anyone needs a Bible, just raise your hand. Holland's going to go around. We have extra Bibles. I want to make sure everybody can follow along in the Word. If you're driving and listening to this, don't follow along. Just listen. And uh, I, 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 you know, because I'm so used to telling everyone, turn to this passage in the Bible, and I forget that the people listening while they're commuting might um, try to do so. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to just listen. And uh, when you get there, you can highlight the verses that God speaks to you from the text. But this morning, we're going to pick up. Now, Paul last week had, uh, in chapter 2, had said that he went back to Jerusalem. And he, Paul was recounting his testimony of what the Lord had done in his life. You know, the things that God had had worked in him and called him to do. He said that, that he was the apostle called to the Jews or the Gentiles. Do you remember? To the Gentiles. And he says, and, and while he recognized this, when he went to Jerusalem, he had a discussion with Cephas or Peter about this. And, and he recognized Peter's calling was the apostle to the Jews. And sometimes because of my Catholic upbringing, I was always taught Peter was the first pope in the Catholic Church. And then I kind of got surprised when I found out he wasn't made the pope until 300 A.D., between 300 and 400 A.D., so he was already dead. And um, they pope they popeized him. I don't know how else to call it. They made him a pope after he's already dead, which is really strange. But anyway, um, he he I for some reason because being raised Roman Italian Roman Catholic, I thought Peter for sure was the was the the apostle to to Rome. 
you know, to the to the Italians. He's got to be right. And that, I don't know why. It's just you know a, a cultural heritage thing. I just thought he was. But uh, I was shocked to find out he wasn't. He was the one who God called to be the, the pastor there in Jerusalem to the Jewish believers, what we call the completed Jews, the ones who had received Christ as their Messiah and believed in Jesus as the Mashiach, the, the, the Messianic, the, the Savior, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. And so he was effectually working, Paul says, for the Lord in his calling, to, to be an apostle to the to the Jews, and Paul says, and I was, I was doing my calling of being the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, was Paul a Jew or a Gentile? He's a Jew. He studied on studied under Gamaliel, one of the m chief rabbis, one of the most, um, you know, how you say like, if, if, as far as going to rabbinical school, if you got to study under him, he was the top of the top. In, in the Jewish culture at the time, studying the things about the Word. And ironically, God would take all of that studying, what Paul did. He studied all, you know, to, Paul actually earned the title Pharisee of Pharisees. This is the top of the, t of the top class of the Pharisees. When you get this title, Pharisee of Pharisees, you have done a lot of homework. In fact, you've had to write out the entire book of Isaiah. It was a scroll back then. And every jot, every tittle in Hebrew, every, that's every vowel, every consonant, every inflection, all handwritten out. You would write your own copy, and you were to memorize it. So talk about having, you know, really become acquainted with, with what we call our Old Testament. He had to write out the law, the Pentateuch, the five books of the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Oh, there's a real easy read. And Numbers and Deuteronomy, and he had to be acquainted with all of those 613 Levitical statutes that break down the Ten Commandments. Paul was a student of the law. Now, we, we saw that Paul said that when he arrived in Jerusalem, he noticed that Peter had withdrawn from eating with the Gentiles. And Paul went and opposed him, he said, to his face. He said, Peter, the Lord showed you that what he calls clean, you do not call what? Unclean. Yet you will not eat with the Gentiles anymore, and that's hypocrisy. Because God has already called salvation not just to the Jew, it was to the Jew first, but then to the Gentile. And so now, Paul arrives and he sees that Peter has been swayed by the, the, the men that came from James, that, that they were swayed, and, and they started to to withdraw and only begin to eat with the Jews as according to the, the, the custom of the Old Testament law. And so Paul told them, he said, this isn't right. You should stop that. And so he, so he did, and uh, he, he, he at least reproached him. I don't know whether Peter began to eat with the Jews again or not, but I know that Paul, Paul told him, look, we're Jews by nature. We're not from amongst the, the, the ones, the sinners amongst the Gentiles. But we don't, even come, we don't even live the law. You know, why are you trying to put the law on these Gentiles? And so Paul is going to go on to explain the relationship of us as Christians with this Old Testament law. And this is really important. I know that as Christians, you know, you're going to run into certain sects that especially in the in the United States of America we have some different groups that that run around and they actually pick and choose parts of the Old Testament covenant and they weave those parts into their Christianity and I want to show you today something that you ought to know from the scripture to help you maybe be able to process whether the things what they're incorporating are being done in the right spirit because sometimes people take the letter of the law of the Old Testament and they try to impose it on the Christian experience today and they wind up falling so short. They wind up messing up and they actually stumble a lot of people with their doctrines. So let me show you something this morning that will help you in processing these things when they, you might run into somebody that says, oh, you're a Christian? Well, do you keep the law? You know, it's okay that you're a Christian, but you know, did, just like what Paul ran into, they, they said to, to the Gentile believers that were coming to the faith, well, 
that's fine. You keep that that you that you hold to Jesus and faith in Jesus. That's good. But are you circumcised? You know, right away they they went to the to the Levitical law and said you haven't been circumcised. Therefore, you you know you're you're not really holy to God. Now, does God look at the outward? We went over this last week. Is He interested in the outside of the man, or the heart within, the heart? And this is where. People who are going to make the, the very same mistake the church made at Galatia is being made today. And we need to be aware, just to help us be able to answer with, the, with an answer that is from God's spirit, how to approach these things. How should we deal with these things? Let me show you. Paul, in verse 20 of chapter 2, uh, this is we read up to this verse, so let's pick up there this morning. He said, I have... I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. For the life, he says, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. You know, if we could be righteous before God by keeping the law, Jesus wouldn't have had to die for us. But can any of us keep the law? What's, a, what's the scripture say? If you break the law in just one part, the scripture says you're guilty of the whole thing. So breaking the whole thing. So there was only one who, who kept the entire law. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to do what? To fulfill it. And Christ fulfilled the law. As only he could, because none of us are perfect and could, could fulfill the law. But he did on our behalf. And therefore, Paul goes on, and this is where chapter 3, verse 1 picks up. It says, you foolish Galatians. He says, who bewitched you? Before whose eyes was Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? He said, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? By works of the law or by hearing with faith? How had the Galatian church received the Holy Ghost? Did they do works of the law? Did they keep the Ten Commandments? Did they work out through the 613 Levitical statues to get the law, I mean the Spirit of God to come to them? No. They heard the message of Christ crucified for them and died and buried and resurrected and, and, and just the faith to believe what that gift what God gave when they when that when that word came to their ears and they heard it and it sank into their spirits and they believed it God imparted to them right then a gift the gift of his holy spirit he didn't make them keep the law he didn't make them do anything special he just saw that they had faith to receive the gift of salvation and with that gift God goes, you're going to need some help. Here's my spirit, the helper, the Holy Ghost who comes. And it says the Holy Ghost comes to be what? The one that teaches us and leads us and guides us. He brings to our remembrance all the things, what, what Christ has spoken. That's the Holy Spirit's work in us. It says in another passage, he convicts us concerning sin. You ever felt like no one's around they don't even know that you're, you, 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 no, no one's watching. And you start to do something and, and this little voice goes, uh, 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 you shouldn't do that. And you're like, nobody's here. What, where did that little voice come from? You, you know it's not you because you want to do it. So you're sure it ain't you saying that. So what is that little voice doing that? That still small voice what we read about in the Psalms. Whose voice is that? The voice of the Holy Spirit of God given to us to convict us, to keep us from, from stumbling, to, to guard our way. And Paul, he, he recognized that this church had a, well, he called it bewitching. Someone cast a spell on them. He said, who cast a spell on you to make you think that you somehow received the Spirit by works of the law? See, Today, there's some churches that believe they earn God's favor and his portion of his spirit by doing certain works. If we go on missions for God, then he's pleased with us and he gives us his spirit. If we go and do certain things for him, we teach Sunday school or, 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 or we give to the church, whatever, 
works that they might come up with. They think somehow some works will get them favor with God. But see, the only thing that really gives us favor, the only work, what we read that Jesus, when Jesus was asked, he was asked in John's gospel, what works was, must we do to be saved? Do you remember that? In John's gospel, they asked him, what works was, must we do to be saved? And he said, this is the work you must do. You must believe on him whom God has sent. Um, who was he talking about? Himself. You just got to believe on me. I'm the one God sent. That's all the work required for your salvation. Now, if you come out to our Tuesday night study, we're studying the book of Ephesians, the very next epistle in the Bible. And, and it's very clear when Paul writes the church at Ephesus, he said it, that we are saved by grace through what? Not through works, through faith. And he says, not, as, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. We can't. It's a gift. It's just a gift given to us. And yet there is something within human nature that likes the idea of, you know, maybe I could do something and get earn God's favor. I could somehow, you know, get in good with him if I could just do the right, the right works to please him. Well, he did all the work for us to save us. And we have to be careful. It is appealing to our flesh to think that we could somehow supplement God's gracious gift with our effort. When the scripture is very clear, and if you were with us on Tuesday night, the, the, the book of Ephesians says that right after it says God saved us just by faith. It's his grace. By grace we've been saved through faith. Not not of works, not a result of works. But, interestingly enough, if you read the next verse in Ephesians, this is Ephesians 2, 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Verse 9 says, not a, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. And verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus now look at this. We were created in Christ Jesus for a purpose. Anyone notice what the purpose is? Look at Ephesians 2. Just skip a couple pages in your Bible forward. So Ephesians 2.10. We were created in Christ Jesus for what? I want you to see this. For good works. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. Wait a minute. First he says we're saved by faith. It's a gift. Nobody can earn it. There's no works that can do it. And then he says, and now we are God's special workmanship. That, what's that mean? We're his workmanship. What's he doing? He's working on us, right? And as his work in us is being done, there's a purpose. We were prepared by God to do good works. Do the good works save us? No. Are we to walk in good works as a, as a believer? Yes. But so quickly, people like to subtly twist these things. There, there are some real false preachers out there that will tell you, you must do these good works to be saved. And I've, I've been to one particular church. They taught us you have, to, you have to join their church. You have to be baptized in their church. You must go on missions for their church. You must give money to that church. And then you must give more money. And, and all these things. Be married in that church. I mentioned it last week. Wear holy underwear. <laughs> be sealed in their temple. And all of these things were works that, that they taught were required for your salvation. That's wrong. Now, by the way, this is the church, the, latter, the church of the Latter-day Saints. Some of you guys have heard of this church, the Mormon church. I was excommunicated from that church because I asked, wait a minute, I thought Jesus said the work we do is believe on him to be saved. Is that right? And all I did was read. Now, I made the mistake. I, I was a young, zealous uh, believer, and, and I came to faith and found out that the Mormons were telling me there was the only true church. 
And so you needed to read the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price and your Bible. Well, that's four different books. And when I put them all next to each other, the Bible had like the most pages. The Book of Mormon and the DNC and those ones were short, you know, a couple hundred pages. And the Bible was like a couple thousand. So I thought I'll memorize the... Uh, they wanted you to carry all these books with you to do the missions. And so I thought, there's a lot of books. And I'm a, I had the backpacker's mentality. You know, everything you carry in your backpack gets heavier and heavier the farther you walk. So, so I thought, I'll just memorize all those other books first because I have photographic memory. So I just memorized those books, and I made the mistake of memorizing them first. And then I started to read the Gospel of John. And as I got through the Gospel of John, I didn't even get to the, to the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And all of a sudden, I had all these problems because what Jesus taught in the Gospel of John conflicted with a bunch of the things what I was reading from the bishops and, the, and Joseph Smith's writings in, in the Book of Mormon and in the Doctrine and Covenants of the Mormon Church. And I, So I just asked my, my Bible study teacher, excuse me, I got a question. Jesus says you do this to be saved. You just, you just believe on him. And there was that fellow on the cross that said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, before he said that, he told the other thief, shut up. Because remember, the other thief was mocking and saying, if you're the Messiah, why don't you get down off of here, save yourself and save us? And that would have been a real quagmire because if Jesus would have saved himself, would he have saved us? No. But the, the other thief said, shut up. We, we deserve what we're getting. We are guilty. This man, he said, has done how much wrong? Nothing. And it's interesting to me how simple salvation is. A recognizing of the thief's sin. He recognized his own sin. And he recognized Christ didn't have sin. And so he turned to him. He said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you, this day, you shall be with me where? In paradise. Now, raise a hand, if you don't mind. Who believes that guy went to be in paradise that day? Of course. Did he get sealed in the Mormon church? Did he get baptized? Did he go on Mormon mission? Did he have his attendance sticker? Did he give his 10%? Did he give gifts above the 10%? Did he do all of the... There's 10, by the way, there's 10 different steps that you're taught in the Mormon church that you must do to ensure your salvation. I say, you foolish Galatians, I mean Mormons, who has bewitched you? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? This, by the way, we could just substitute different names of different groups today that have gone on to try to work out works to, to say we have the Spirit because we do these works, when indeed the, the Spirit's only given as a gift. Just comes to you because you have faith in Jesus. Just like salvation went to that man, that thief, that day, when he recognized, I'm a sinner, Christ, you're sinless. Would you remember me? That's all it took. Jesus said, done. Now, I, I did, did he get baptized? I know some churches teach, unless you be baptized, you can't be saved. And some teach specifically, you must be baptized in their particular group. It's a bit exclusive, don't you think? Especially some of these groups that have only been around since the 18th century. I feel bad for all the ones, you know, for the 1,700 years prior to that. None of them got saved, I guess, according to their doctrines. They're kind of missing out on the richness of the gospel. That's baloney. You know, it's ironic to me that in the Americas we have some people that so arrogantly think that they are the special chosen ones. In these days that somehow they have this special dispensation. They have more of God's spirit than those guys even back in the Bible days had. I'm like, wh how do you get off thinking like that? Where, where are we better than those guys? Now, these guys, well, Paul himself, though he was out persecuting Christians and didn't follow Jesus on this earth, he did have an encounter with Jesus. 
he actually had a face-to-face -face with the risen Lord when he was out trying to kill Christians, and the Lord gave him a little pack on the head and blinded him for three days and said, you, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then we saw his conversion, and Jesus said, no longer Saul, but Paul. No longer handsome, desirable one. We're going to call you little one. Little in Hebrew is Paul. Saul is, you know, GQ, kind of. It's, a, it's the male version of handsome, you know. For the girls, it would be beautiful. For When you say Saul, that's the, the masculine version. It's the, like the handsome, you know, the real, really desirable one. Jesus said, we got to change that. Too, you're too full of yourself. We're going to call you, no more, no more of that. We're going to call you from Saul to, now it, it might be subtle to you. In English, most people don't catch it. But in the Hebrew, it's very powerful. You're too full of yourself. We're going to call you little. We had to take you down a few notches, Paul. And this man who God would take down a few notches would certainly come to know. Now, if anyone knew the law, Pharisee of Pharisees, he knew the law, the requirements of the law. But he recognized that there was a deception coming over the Galatian church that they had begun to try to earn God's spirit by works rather than receiving his spirit as a gift. And so he goes on to explain to them. Verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, now you are trying to be perfected by the flesh. Did you suffer so many things in vain? Indeed, it, it, it was in vain. He says, Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, even so, Paul writes, Abraham. Abraham. Now, is Abraham a big deal to the Jews? What's his title in the Jewish culture? Father of what? Of the faith. Even Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Oh, there in Genesis, was that chapter 15, about a couple verses down around 5, 6? Abraham believed the Lord, when the Lord spoke, he believed what God spoke. And because of that, Abraham is called the father of the faith. Now, therefore, Paul says, to be sure that it is those who are of faith that are truly the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. He said, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many are, are the works of the law, those who are, are, are trying to be of the law, he says, are under the law, and they're under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. If you break just one of the law, just one statute, the law declares that you're guilty of the whole thing. Throw the book at them. You break one thing, you broke it all. It's a curse. The problem is, I can't make it through like the first three or four. I'm done. And I'm talking the biggies. Just start with the Ten Commandments. That's before they broke it down into the, into the you know, sub-statutes. Just try to break. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's anything. Not that we would ever covet something our neighbor has, right? Thou shalt, I mean, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God, thy God, in what? In vain. I'm pretty sure I broke that before. I'm done. You break just one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. Now, why would God make such a rule book that nobody could keep it? Who would be the only one that would keep it? Jesus. Let me show you this. Now Paul says, now that no one is justified by the law before God, he says, it is evident. For, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he says, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's a gift, guys. Now, brother, and he says, I speak in terms of human relations. Though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it is made and it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. When you make a conditional covenant, you, you go and you say, I'm going to purchase this piece of land for this much money. And you, and you put the earnest deposit down and you sign the contracts. After, after the contract and everything is all sealed up, do they go back afterwards and say, well, we changed our mind. We're going to raise it, you know, du double the, the sale price. After you've signed the thing, the price you agreed on is, is done. The, the contract is, is sealed. Now, Paul, Paul says that this is what, what was happening when God made a covenant with man through Abraham. Here, verse 16 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say to his seeds as referring to many, but rather to one, to your seed, that is Christ. Now, what I'm saying is this, Paul says, the law which came, now this is important, I know this is boring to some Christians, but did the law come before Abraham or after Abraham? This is a really important thing for you to learn. You don't have to learn all of the Old Testament history, but this is a good thing to know. Which one came first? Let's read right here, you can see it, I'll show you. It says, Paul said, what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not involve, in, invalidate the covenant previously ratified. In other words, Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him as righteousness because of Abraham's faith. God made a covenant with Abraham. There was no law. By the way, Moses hadn't even been a twinkle down line from, he's got to come all the way down, you know, 430 years later. So, so there's no Moses around to get the Ten Commandments. God made a covenant first. It would be like us saying, we made a bill of sale for a property and, you know, five, ten generations later, one of the kids goes, um, I'd like to make some new addendums to the thing. Paul says, you don't, you don't nullify the covenant was made in the first place. It still stands. It's grandfathered in. That's what we say today. You know, they already own the property. They bought it, paid for it, it's done. Deal has been done. Salvation came by faith first. So you say, well, then why did the law come? And that's a good question. I love it when the, the young Christians, they, the, their wheels are turning. Pastor, I don't get it. Why, did the, why the rules? Don't worry, just read on. Galatians 3 answers this beautifully. Paul gives, if anyone knew the law and why it was given, it would be the guy who studied it so much. Let me show you what he says. He says here, verse 18, For if the inheritance base is based on the law, it's no longer based on a promise. But God has granted to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? Well, it was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed, the seed, who was the seed? Jesus. Till the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one part only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? He says, God forbid, may it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then Righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin. For the promise by faith in Jesus Christ, or that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. You know, when you read the law, every man finds himself to be guilty of sin. It shuts us all up. We're, now, I... Personally, I don't know about you, but I've never had a problem with the fact that I'm a sinner. I'm, I confessed this last week. Some people are like, Pastor, you shouldn't say you're a sinner. What? The Bible says we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. What, I'm special? 
No. You know what Paul said? Paul said he was the chiefest amongst the sinners. Yet he was shown a great portion of grace because he said he acted in ignorance. And God, God knows, even in our ignorance, we do some stupid things. Don't we? And yet he's so loving. Verse 23, I, I just want to finish this chapter. Bear with me here just for a couple minutes. He says, the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor freeman, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to what? The promise. You're, you're in the family. You're an heir. Does it matter if you're a Jew, a Greek, male, female, bond, slave, free? He says, it doesn't matter. You're in inheritance. Now, some people tell me this, um, so there is no male, no female in Christ and no roles that we fulfill. No, it doesn't say that. It's not talking about, about that we were created to fulfill the callings, what we were made to, to fulfill. God has made, he said he made Adam, and then from Adam he took a rib and he made Eve. He made them male and female from the beginning, gave him one commandment. I like this one. They're in a garden. They're both naked. They're, they're perfect. There's no sin. By the way, this is before the fall. It says they were naked and they were not ashamed. You know that sin had not crept in yet. Because I, I, I never hear people, you know, happy with themselves so much when they have to strip down to their skivvies. They're always like, oh, I've got a work to do. and oh, I'm ashamed of this over here and that little bump there. and That's sin. They didn't have it. And they, and they were told just be fruitful and multiply. Given a, that's the first command in the Bible to mankind. Beautiful. Yet, it's not a matter of are you male or are you female. You are in God's family. You are, you are going to receive of his inheritance of Christ. There's, a, there's an inheritance. Now, you know, in my family, I have brothers and sisters. And, you know, the inheritance... We, we don't look at it like, well, you're one of the girls and I'm one of the boys and, and therefore the girls don't get anything and only the boys get something. That does not, that's not how it works. Inheritance goes to all of the kids. And Paul's pointing this out. The inheritance we have in Jesus is available to everybody. Why do some groups make it exclusive? Like it only goes to their special group. Not the other Christians. They're just unless you, unless you're under their banner with their moniker, then you can't be saved or you can't have the special things. That, by the way, is a very bewitched teaching. You can just write in their name right here, you foolish whatever group they are, who bewitched you to think that you got the Spirit of God by some special dispensation. It's a gift. It's a gift. His spirit is. And it's not by works of the law. The law was our tutor. What's a tutor do? Teach you, right? If a tutor's job is to teach you, this is, there's a certain path to God. There's one way. And the law was very good at teaching this, by the way, because how many people had fulfilled the law? We only have record of one. So if the tutor says, everybody has blown it, except one. I remember when Jesus 
came in John 14. What's he say in verse 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. There in John 14, 6. And no one comes to the Father except through what? Through me. If he's the only way in, and the law is saying, everyone else, you've blown it. But there is one way, and that's Christ over there. And the law points us to Christ, and we come to know what the law is teaching us. The law is saying, go to Christ, go to Christ. And we finally go to Christ. Has the law done its job? Yeah. Now, Paul's point, a man who is a student of the law, who knows the law well, says, once you get the point that the tutor is teaching, once you know the message that the tutor is saying, go to him, and you go to him, do you have need of the tutor? No. The tutor did his job. He said, that's the function of the law. When some people say to you today, hey, are you one of those Christians that follow the law? I say, I sure do. The whole spirit of it. Because the spirit of the law teaches me I'm a sinner and that Christ is sinless. And the law teaches me who I have to go to. It says, I got to go to, I got to go to Jesus. And I'm a student of the law. I, Jesus didn't say I abolished it. I what? Fulfilled it. He fulfilled every bit of it. And the law is doing its job in pointing us to the Messiah. Now, Paul would tell you, after you have come to know what the tutor's lesson is, do you need the tutor anymore? No, because you have the Messiah. That's the whole point of the thing. But why do some churches... By the way, I, I think they are bewitched because they've gone back to the law thinking that the Messiah is over there, he's good and all, but we need to add a little extra effort. We've got to help him out a little. Maybe he didn't get it all done. Let me tell you, when Christ hung on that cross, his final words were, it is what? Finished. And he gave up his spirit. He knew what he was doing. He fulfilled it. He paid it all. You don't get to add to it. And if anybody comes along teaching you something like, you must add these things so that you can have salvation, you tell them, you're bewitched. Someone put a spell on you. Wake up. Snap to it. You know, wake up. Come out of that delusion. And do we have churches today in America that are doing this very same? Now, by the way, I can't, I'm not going to knock them and, and, and try to be little. If this is in the Bible and this was going on back then, why was this recorded, do you think? Do you think there's any lesson here for us that we can learn and we can say, we need to be careful. We don't try to add to the finished work of our Christ. He did the, he did the fullness required for salvation. Now, is there good works for us to walk in? Yes. Those are for us to receive the, the blessings of what God has as He directs our steps. He has prepared from the foundation of the world good works for us to walk in. And when you do walk in those good works, don't think they make you more saved. They don't. But they do give you an opportunity to do the work what He has prepared for you to do. And the Scripture teaches us. It says... Make your calling, your election sure. Know what it is God's called you to do. And do it. Do it wholeheartedly for the Lord. Whatever you do, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as unto who? Unto the Lord. It, whatever service. You work at a job. Perhaps you're a cashier or you're, you're a fireman or you're, you're, you're whatever. You're working in an office somewhere. Whatever work you're doing, the Bible says, do your work as you're doing it as service unto the Lord. Now, when we do anything unto the Lord, if we give a cup of water in the name of Jesus to a little one, Jesus says it's like we did it to him. We do all that we do, hopefully, as our service to the Lord. Now, will the Lord reward us? This is not about your salvation. This is about getting treasure. You guys, some of you are going to be paupers upstairs. Poor boys. You're going to get there and you'll be like, how come Izzy has, where is Izzy? I always tell the kids this, you know. 
When they're looking for me in heaven, they're like, I thought Pastor would have made it. Tell them, look up. Up. Find the highest mountain of jewels. Treasures galore. I mean a mountain pile. And the little guy at the very top, the little stick man jumping up down going, Wee woohoo, look at my pile. That'll be me. As I am going for the biggest pile of treasure I can possibly store up in heaven. Because Jesus told me, if I put my treasures there, that's where my heart will be. And no man will steal those treasures. No moth, no rust will destroy it. No one can take those treasures away. And those treasures, now see, I've shared this before, but some of the guys get a little bit tiffy with me when I tell them, that they're like, I, you ain't getting the biggest pile. I'm going to get a bigger pile than you. And then they'll say, no, I'm going to get a bigger pile than you. Good. Go to it. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to stimulate you to love and to good deeds. The old King James says, I'm supposed to provoke you to love and good. Now, guys can easily be provoked. You say, my pile will be bigger than your pile. They're like, no way, man. I'm going to, that's it. I'm going to start finding out what good works God wants me to do. I'm going to, I'm maxing my pile out. I'm going to, I'm going to higher and deeper, wider. I'm going for it. And, you know, if I can get guys to do that, I'm doing well. But am I getting them to earn their salvation when I tell them to walk in those good works? To do the things what Christ would have them do? No. That's nothing about your salvation. That's just that's just about the extra treasure you're gonna get. That's like the the award banquet. That's that's just well, that's part of the pile of the super cool things that God has in store. Those things that I you know, I, I know that our minds cannot even fathom how great a thing what the Lord will have for us. You know, we, we think, oh, maybe God will give me something special. You know, my daughter, Joy, she's always loved horses. I've shared this before. She was like, Daddy, will there be animals in heaven? And because she was taking horse riding lessons when she was little, and she was like, oh, Daddy, I hope they have horses. I said, honey, they have horses, but they're not these base models. She said, what do you mean? I said, the horses in heaven, they fly. Flying horses? I said, yeah. It's in the book of Revelation, right? It's in Revelation. She's like, I can't wait. I want a flying horse. I said, you're going to get one. And so will everyone who believes. That we will come back with him on these flying horses. Now, you talk about an upgrade from the horses down here. You know, when be, we, have you read about the creatures in the book of Revelation? With a face of an eagle and a man and a bear and all on one creature. Four different faces on what you think they upgraded. You know, they don't, it says they don't even have to turn the head to look because they got two eyes going this way, two eyes going that way, two that way, and two that way. I mean, she's going creepy, but you know, I think it's cool. I mean, beyond what we think or imagine, there's going to be such things. And you know, when I tell the kids, yeah, when I, I, I love windsurfing when I was smaller. And, uh, and I told the kids, but, but I, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord for a windsurfer that can windsurf on the clouds. You know, forget kite surfing. I'm going to windsurf through the clouds. You'll be like, who's that guy skipping off the clouds over there? Woo, woo, doing flips. That will be me. On my little cloud surfer, you know, jet ski thing that the Lord makes. I mean, there'll be, st guys, there'll be stuff. That, now, that's my imagination. You know, can God do better than I can think? Says his... His lowest thought toward me is greater than my highest thought toward him. I mean, I think I'm thinking of something cool. And he's going, you have no idea what I have waiting for you. We got we to gotta just abide in the faith in Christ that the law has been pointing us toward. And don't let anybody bewitch us into thinking we can earn it. We can't. It's a gift. All we do to get a gift is what? When I say, here's a present, you just have to receive it. When Christ comes as the gift of God, for God so loved the world, he what? He gave his only begotten son. Jesus has been given as a gift. And all you have to do is receive him. And you get salvation. And when you do, it's not by any works any things you can boast is just a present where God says, I want to give you my son. Do you want him? 
And you know, it's funny because when people, some people really struggle with this, and that some of them, this really, I, I'll tell this message and they'll go, man, I couldn't, I laid on my bed, I was so mad, all I could hear is, Jesus is a present. He's a present and you got to receive. I don't want to receive it. <laughs> and then it just kept rolling through their head. It's, have you ever seen people fight against receiving the best present ever? I have. I've seen people go, I don't know what that Christianity is going to change me. I said, I hope so. I mean, some guys really need changing. I was one that needed it. And I don't know why some people think that's such a bad thing. Because without Christ changing us, what trouble we'd be in. So, Paul, this is the part we get to today. That in Gal at the church of Galatia, a spell had been cast on them. But Paul says something that we need to know. It's always the truth that sets us what? Free. Let's go back to the simplicity of the gift that's been offered by God, His Son. And let's tell people, the law, yeah, it's good. It, it points us to the one guy who fulfilled the law, Christ. But before the law ever came, the fact that God was pleased with men who believed is already an established covenant. Because Abraham believed 430 years before the law, and he was it was counted to him as righteousness. No law included. Now my question to you is, what if someone never heard the law, but they heard about Jesus? Could they be saved? Yes. And if some group comes along and says, but you have to add the law in. No, there's an original covenant already established. The covenant of Abraham was already made. Abraham believed God. And it was counted to Abraham as what? Righteousness. It counts without the law. The law was added because of transgression. We just need to get it, you know, a little grip on why did God put it there? So he can point out the sin. So he can point out the need of a Savior. But Abraham believed it before the law even came. And you know, you might have a friend who believes it, never heard of the law. But they hear of Jesus and they believe. And you know what? That counts. Because they're just being grandfathered in by the original covenant that God made. Let's not get, you know, pompous and think we're better because we studied some of the Old Testament rules. And don't make those rules anything about salvation because they're not. They're just things that point out our sin. They're our tutor to lead us to Jesus. God forbid we should miss Jesus and get stumbled by the law like these guys were. Now next week, if you have time, would you read ahead for me in the next chapter? This is going to this gonna transition to one of the coolest things for our faith. Once you get this idea down that it's just a gift that God wants to give you, well, stuff starts to open up for us as believers. Some of the greatest things of, you know, what's included with this spirit that was given to us by faith, that's coming up. And it's marvelous. And it, it'll really encourage you. If you get a chance, just read ahead, and uh, we'll come back to this next week. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege we have to be out here on this beach, just to be able to study your word, to, to see these things that point us to your son. And I pray for anyone who might not have received your son yet, that today what they heard would, would be a seed that would be planted in their heart. Or seeds uh, that have been planted, Lord, this would be water, living water that would water those seeds of faith and bring them to a faith in Jesus that they too could receive the gift what you have offered, that gift of salvation. Lord, you said if any man would believe in him, in your son, that they would not perish but have everlasting life. We just pray. We have friends, loved ones, Lord, even a few enemies that need your salvation. We pray for them as we close in prayer today that you would bring salvation to their doorstep and right into the doorpost, the lintel of their heart. It would come into them. Give them salvation, Lord, as you've gifted to us. We pray in Jesus' name.
Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.